Good morning. I'm Tim Nyland, and today we are discussing asset allocation in a post-COVID world. We're going to identify four macro factors that are going to shape asset allocation models over the next five years. And we're going to look at what you need to pay attention to so that your performance does not fall short of your client's expectations. Before we get started, please like, comment, and subscribe, and come back every week for more videos on investing strategy and making the most of Zach's Pro platforms. If you would like to do the kind of analysis you're going to see in this video, then you'll need to have a ZAT Portfolio Manager subscription, which includes both Zax Advisor Tools and the Zax Research System. Well, let's go ahead and get started with the four macro factors. So these are the four factors that are definitely going to be shaping the asset allocation models that you're currently using over the next five years, whether you like it or not. Uh, the concept of total public debt as a percent of GDP is massive, and we'll review it here in just a minute, but um, it's, a, it's a very vicious cycle that the Fed is wrestling with, and you'll see that it has implications uh, across all asset classes. And interestingly enough, all four of these macro factors are very much so related. So point number two, economic growth expectations. Um, this expectation for economic growth is, is huge, and it is a massive driver, obviously, for the manufacturing and services sectors, and we're going to take a look at, um, at some of those reads and talk about that more closely as well. So equity risk premium, obviously one of my favorite topics. Uh, I've been warning investors about this for probably the past year. And we now have equity risk premium sitting at 20 year lows and equity risk premium continues to literally absorb the entire move up in the 10 year treasury uh, in terms of being able to sustain the PE multiples that we are experiencing now, these elevated levels of, of forward PE on the S&P 500 and elsewhere. And we're gonna take a look at impl implications related to equity risk premium going forward. Point number four is obviously yield, yield, yield. And again, if you just take a, take a step back and look at these four points, you'll see that they're very, very much so uh, interwoven and related. Um, what I want to mention here briefly is, is be sure to request this slide deck this week. It'll be a really, really good uh, point of reference for you over the next several years to go back and, and revisit some of these things that we're going to identify. Um, some of these things aren't as obvious as you would think, and um, to be able to go back to them will will come in handy. Uh, what I want everyone to notice as we're as we're working through these macro factor slides here over the next several minutes is just to to make note of the extreme levels uh, of these trends that we're at, and and really try to think about what that means for your asset allocation, what you, what it means specifically for your models. So let's go ahead and look at these four factors uh, a little bit more closely. This is a chart that you've seen in, in prior webinars. Uh, I showed it back in April of 2020 when we hit the, the official high of 135% federal debt as a percent of, of GDP. And, um, and you know, it, this is an interesting ratio because the larger this ratio gets, the more reliant the U.S. economy becomes on underlying economic growth to basically service these debt obligations. So obviously, along with that growth comes the threat of inflation. And I want everybody to see how we've come off the peak, but we still haven't receded. And so you really need to take a closer look at the components of this ratio to determine exactly how we are staying level here. So we've kind of we've kind of hit this plateau of a, roughly 127, this is 127.52, just call it 125, and we've leveled off. Um, certainly after after the Fed meeting last week, we we're all aware that that long-term inflation is now squarely on the Fed's radar. And it's interesting to note that if you decompose this ratio, and again, I'm just doing this in in Zach's advisor tools. Uh, in the fundamental charting facility, we just grab these economic data items right out of the database. Very easy to do. And um, what I want everybody to see is that is that basically total public debt as a percent of GDP has stabilized because GDP growth is actually keeping pace with the increase in government spending. So it might look a little bit deceptive here that oh, government spending has subsided. 
uh, because this ratio has come down. I mean, it's only really come down relative to the growth in GDP. So we've had a tick up in GDP growth, but now we're not getting any progress, right? Because basically our GDP growth is literally just treading water with the constant increase in government spending. And so this, this constant you know, need for this, this growth in the economy to service this debt obligation um, is obviously going to increase the risk of, of rising rates associated with inflation. And as this happen, happens, it's going to make the public debt even more expensive to service. So you can see that the Federal Reserve has a very delicate line to walk uh, in trying to keep inflation tame longer term. So a, a very vicious cycle, one that we definitely need to keep our eyes on. Obviously, this has implication for interest rates. Um, the next point, uh, this is point number two in, um, in, in how these macro factors are going to shape asset allocation models over the next five years, is that we have this unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus coupled with this vaccine reopening phenomenon that has that has triggered the largest ISM reads in history for both manufacturing and services sectors. Now, this is the Institute of Supply Management. If you've watched my webinars, you'll notice uh, these to be very familiar. These are my favorite uh, forecast series to watch. Uh, the Federal Reserve watches them as well. Remember that anything above 50 is expansionary, anything below uh, 50 is a sign of forecast uh, economic contraction. So these are very much forecast indicators of things to come, right, in the manufacturing and services sectors. And these are simply surveys that are performed literally once a month. And what we're seeing here, again, is the highest read in history for ISM, both manufacturing and services. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because it's actually happening at a time where we are experiencing supply chain constraints, supply chain bottlenecks, labor shortages, you name it. So we've got this monstrous demand uh, forecast uh, coupled with these supply chain issues that can really add fuel short term uh, to inflation. And this is obviously the core argument for the transitory uh, inflation that, that the Federal Reserve is expecting to abate here over the next several months. Remember, when we start talking about embedding inflation long-term, that's really more of a cost-driven approach from labor and continued increases in commodities prices. So very, very different scenario that we're looking at here. Although keep in mind that these ISM reads uh, this high will will be a precursor for demand to come for months on end. These are these are levels that we just haven't seen ever. When we start looking at equity risk premium, this is the the one that I continue to to harp on that investors need to pay real close attention to. Because if you look at the PE multiple for the S&P 500, and I've got that here on the top panel. And this is a this is a one to four panel chart, obviously with four panels uh, out of the Zach's research system. And the whole intent of this particular chart is to basically give justification for the total equity discount rate that is being used in the bulk of the models that are being run on Wall Street in terms of calculating equity valuations. So this total equity discount rate is the discount rate uh, that most Wall Street firms are using to basically determine what equities are worth today. And it's, it's obviously there's many different skins of equity risk premium, okay? The idea here is that from a macro perspective, you have a risk-free rate. Most models use the 10-year treasury. You add to the risk-free rate some premium for being invested in equities. And when you do that, you end up with a total equity discount rate. So it's literally the risk-free rate, which is the 10-year treasury, plus a premium for being in equities gives you that total equity discount rate. And the idea here that I have been preaching for months on end, actually years on end, is that 
interest rates themselves really don't have a lot to do with PE multiples. And I know I've said this in prior webinars, I'm going to say it again. Uh, you can evidence that by the fact that we traded at the same elevated levels of PE back here in 2001, 2002, when the 10 year was at 5455. Five, uh, and we are trading at those same levels of PE multiple now with the 10 year at anywhere between, you know, call it 0.5 to 1.5. So the, 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 uh, certainly the, the velocity of, of change of the 10 year can actually impact the PE ratio short term. But what really impacts PE ratios from a macro perspective is this concept of equity risk premium. And traditionally speaking, equity risk premium moves inversely to treasury yields. And during these types of, of economic phenomena that we're dealing with now, traditionally equity risk premium will absorb somewhere in the neighborhood of 75% of the move in a 10-year treasury. And what we've seen here since the onset of COVID is that as the 10-year treasury yield has risen, the equity risk premium has actually declined and been able to absorb nearly 100% uh, of that increase in treasury yield. And we can evidence that by the fact that the total equity discount rate has literally stayed the same. And it's this total equity discount rate staying the same that has allowed the PE multiple for the S&P 500 to stay the same. So everyone says, well, rising rates and, and this is gonna be bad for equities. And months ago, remember I, I warned everyone that look out for equity risk premium because it will actually absorb a lot of the increase near term in the 10 year treasury. And in fact, that's what's happened. Okay, and you can see that here. We're still at elevated levels of PE on the S&P 500 because equity risk premium continues to decline to offset that increase in the 10 year treasury. And keep in mind, I calculate equity risk premium every single week for Zacks. I've been doing the same calculation now for over 25 years. And so um, what we need to watch for equity risk premium though, is that obviously this phenomenon will not last forever. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the next item here is obviously yield. Uh, so this is gonna be macro factor number four. So yields, 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 right? So back in September of 1981, uh, we were obviously in the midst of a healthy recession. We had uh, a, a yield curve that was inverted and Fed Chair Paul Volcker um, pulled out all the stops with all the tools that he had available at his disposal and literally kicked off the longest fixed income bull market in the history of the United States. And you can see here that I've actually got my tool tips on here in advisor tools. You can see that the yield curve is inverted. You can see the two year actually trading at a higher level yield than the, than the 30 year. And again, I don't have the recession shading up here. It, the chart just got a little bit busy for what I was trying to illustrate. But keep in mind that um, when we talk about tilts and we talk about the ECP strategies and we talk about um, when to actually make changes to your allocations in terms of timing, we look to this 10 year, uh, the, the, the two year converging into the, into the 10 and 30 as kind of your indicators to start paying attention. Um, and you can see here that that's what happened um, during the COVID crisis. Oops, excuse me. And then obviously we had COVID. So we already had some precursor indications, indicators that we were gonna be rolling into a recession perhaps sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, it, just, it just so happened to happen a lot quicker because COVID ended up hitting us. But now you can see that we've got a, a, a more healthy interest rate environment. So we've got this divergence um, in, in spreads, and, and we're now entering into a more normalized um, period. Hopefully, we can get rates to, to continue to move up. But what we need to think about here in terms of asset allocation is we need to imagine the losses in the bond market if the 10-year treasury reverts back to basically a 4% rate, uh, which is not unreasonable. And actually would still be at historic lows, relatively speaking. So let's take a look at some of these implications specifically for these particular asset classes. So we'll start with bonds. And there's three things that we need to consider with bonds. 
And for those of you that were that were holding a traditional 60/40 stock bond model during the COVID crash, you experienced firsthand how correlated that that allocation is. These bond models, these 60-40 blend stock bond models are more correlated now than ever. So this needs to be kind of the the basis for challenging our, our thought process and our asset allocation models going forward. That's why it's literally the very first talking point here. So we've also got the benefits of traditional stock bond diversification more muted now than ever because we've got bond yields so low that they literally provide very little cushion to any sort of equity volatility. And I pulled out my calculator. I just did some really, really quick math on my HP 12C. And um, I looked at the 10 year specifically, and I just made a couple assumptions here. So if the US economic growth were to remain subdued, it's highlighted in blue on the screen here, um, sending the 10 year yield to zero. I mean, this is like a worst case scenario, right? Because the Federal Reserve has already said that they're not interested in, in supporting negative rates. Um, so if you assume a 1.5 yield now, I mean, I'm just using round numbers, the maximum upside um, for this 10 year treasury would be roughly 15%. And again, I just use a thousand dollar par, um, you know, interest payable twice a year and, and ran the numbers. So this is literally the best case scenario for bondholders. Um, it gets a little bit more dire on the other side of this, right? So if we return to an inflationary growth environment and that sends the 10 year treasury to 4% and we made our purchase at, a, at a, when it was yielding 1.5%, that 10 year note would literally stand to lose about 20% of its value. So we've got a real risk now of sustained fixed income capital loss for the first time since 1981. And obviously this would only occur if inflation were to actually embed itself long term. So we're still on the fence with that. But certainly this is a risk that we need to take seriously now uh, with our models. So again, just some of the recommendations, um, reducing those bond allocations across all asset allocation models might want to consider something like that. Um, certainly seeking input from the Zach's ETF model portfolio allocations. If you subscribe to that, um, it, it's a great thing to, to monitor. Stay off the long end of the yield curve as much as possible. Um, favor short to intermediate duration bonds in general, just to reduce that interest rate exposure. Uh, really, really common sense one here, favor tips and munis. Um, I, I really like the high quality convertible bonds still, especially the ones that, that feature those embedded call options on the underlying equities. If you look at the high quality convertible bonds, um, a lot of those are tech companies that are issuing those and, um, and that environment is really, really ripe right now um, for, for recovery, that technology environment. We've talked about that in, in previous webinars. Um, as soon as this this value rotation abates a little bit, and it looks like it's taking place right now, and we get into a more normalized uh, part of the economic cycle, which is happening as we speak, um, technology is is obviously going to lead us out. And a lot of those, again, a lot of those convertibles are, are tech are issued by tech companies. Um, favor the floating rate investment grade corporate bonds, right? So this has been one of the largest shifts here in, in bond trends since 2021. Um, I've outlined seven of the largest issuances in order of size. So Verizon, 7-Eleven, Siemens, AT&T, Toyota, Duke, and Next Era, all companies that we've talked about mostly in the past, um, they are now uh, issuing floating rate investment grade corporates so that uh, you know you take some of that that interest rate risk, that threat of inflation um, off investors' hands. So again, if you're if you're using ETFs and mutual funds for your bond allocation, which which absolutely makes sense, uh, be sure that you're checking those Zacks ETF and mutual fund ranks. So we move on to the stock asset class, and there's there's five considerations that I think are really really key, and um, and, and the very first one takes us right back to equity risk premium. But what I wanna mention here, the, the most important part is that stocks will remain the preferred asset class, even in a long-term inflationary environment. But we have to understand 
that PE multiples are poised to contract, okay? And we talked about the fundamental drivers behind that a couple webinars ago um, when I mentioned the fact that the S&P 500 PE multiple can basically revert without actually having to crash, and that was because the underlying earnings would ultimately catch up with the price. So we've got this massive value rotation underway. We've got a lot of the cyclical names being priced on earnings that are still to recover two plus years out. We've seen two and a half, even three years in some cases. As those earnings begin to come in, that PE multiple is going to naturally contract. However, the macro side of that, remember, there's two reasons why PE multiples expand and contract. You've got your fundamental side, which we just talked about. Now you've got your macro side. The macro side is the equity risk premium component, right? It's not interest rates. It's equity risk premium. And when you consider the fact that it's likely that at some point this equity risk premium will um, revert back to its median, and again, this is just based on a normalized Fed policy if we can get there. Um, you can see over the last 20 years, I mean, I, this is very simple to do in the research system. Uh, I literally just plotted these two series for 20 years and threw a median uh, trend line up. You can see that the median equity risk premium, in other words, that premium that investors require above and beyond the risk-free rate just to invest in the equity basket of securities is 5.11% over 20 years. If we are to revert back to an equity risk premium of 5.11%, that PE multiple would literally contract on the S&P 500 to about a 16 multiple. And you can see that here. So I'm not making any guesses. This is based on real data. And we can see um, how inversely correlated that equity risk premium is to PEF12M, okay? So at this point, your question should be, well, what's the driver here? What's the driver to get equity risk premium back up to that 5.11 median? And it's interesting because these drivers can, can change over time. And when we are at levels this extreme, at this point in the economic cycle, any event that threatens the delivery of forecast economic growth can become a trigger to a rise in equity risk premium. So that takes us back full circle to the four macro factors we discussed earlier, because one of them was economic growth expectations, right? So if we get a falter in economic growth expectations, that was my point number two macro factor, that's going to trigger an increase in the equity risk premium, which will then trigger a collapse in the PE multiple for the S&P 500. So again, all of this stuff, all of these factors, they flow together and they're, they're very much um, impacting one another. So it's important to understand how this works. That's point number one for stocks. Point number two is you've got to understand that, that high, higher yield equities will also get punished, right? The higher the yield, the more they behave like bonds. You look at you know, your Verizons, you look at some of these others um, that don't have a lot of growth. And it's basically just due to that, you know, dividend discount model, those cash flows being discounted back, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get punished. However, um, look for high quality dividend paying stocks with long track records of increases that can help offset that inflation, right? So again, we're going to run into an a, a period of time here. At some point, treasury yields are going to become uh, be competing with equity yields, and that's where, where these valuations for, for higher yielding stocks will, will struggle a little bit if they don't have the growth to offset that. So point number three is, is this concept of growth stocks. I've talked about this before. It's super, super important to understand the lost decade that we had in the early 2000s because we're, we're almost teeing up for that again. And it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. So I have growth stocks at point number three up here. It says growth stocks could, and I underline could be, in for single digit returns as PE multiples contract while earnings continue to grow. And this is called a valuation catch up. And you can see that we had in the 90s this massive PE multiple expansion. Keep in mind, this is the price and earnings chart out of the Zacks research system for Microsoft and Walmart. You could do it for Disney. You could do it for Walgreens. I mean, I could give you 30 more names where this played out like a fiddle. And what I want everyone to see here is price line in blue pulling away from earnings line here in orange. And then all of a sudden we have this, this reset 
where stocks basically take a pause and earnings growth continues and continues and continues until the PE multiple or the distance between the blue line and the orange line just collapses to literally a 10. Remember, this is log scale. We scale the earnings by a factor of 10 when the price line crosses the, the earnings line that's trading at a PE multiple of 10. So this is a nice PE multiple expansion. This is the collapse on an actual earnings increase, price decline. You can see over time, Microsoft went nowhere for literally 12 years. Uh, and same thing with Walmart. So it's not just tech, it happened to Walmart as well. And you can see this tremendous earnings growth. It didn't matter. Investors wouldn't pay for it. This is called a valuation catch up. Okay. And now you can see that we've had this tremendous multiple expansion since 2013 here from Microsoft. And it's kind of looking like the same thing that we had at the end of the, the 1990s, although we don't have anywhere near a dot com implosion ready to hit us. Uh, but you can see a very similar pattern here in that multiple expansion. Okay. The next thing we got to look at, this is point number four, is we need to look at the biases in these benchmarks, right? So now that we're through COVID, this is something that, that I've been preaching for years, specifically once COVID hit, um, we rolled out the ECP um, models formally. And my very first tilt webinar was based on the fact that you've got to understand uh, the, the makeup of your benchmarks. And there are literally just five stocks now that make up 21% of the market cap of the S&P 500. So the point here, and this is, this is a really, really important one, is that over diversification will not be your friend in this environment. Just look at your returns over the last month and see if you've lagged the market because a lot of these tech names have started to basically rally. And when you've got five tech names with 21% of the capitalization of the S&P 500 uh, and you're not properly allocated, your returns can suffer. So know what you're holding. The number one source of over diversification is buying ETFs and mutual funds for that matter without having 100% transparency into the constituents of the fund, right? So in advisor tools, you can easily look up the fund constituents. Um, if you use our ETF rank, we actually break down each of the, of the ETFs into its, into its constituents for any of the domestic related um, ETFs. And we roll the Zacks rank up to the actual fund level. So there's, there's a lot of advantages that you have to utilizing the Zacks research and the Zacks rank there but you still need to be aware of what you are holding. And likewise, now the bottom 342 names in market cap equal the top five. So in other words, there is a major bias in the S&P 500, okay? So watch your diversification. Um, one of the points I always like to make, and, and if you run, you know, Monte Carlo simulations and you've looked at the research on optimal equity diversification, you'll know that that it's somewhere between 20 and 30 stocks. And anything more than that, you're you're literally eroding your return potential. Um, if you map your portfolios across an efficient frontier, you can see that as you continue to diversify, diversify, diversify. Uh, it, it can it can seriously erode your your returns um, relative to risk. So I always ask the question, you know, how did we get to a place where we accept core equity portfolios constructed with ETFs and mutual funds? When you combine those those equity holdings, you can have exposure to more than a thousand stocks in a single portfolio. It's very common, and you just have to wonder um, how we've come to a point where we now accept that. I, I would challenge that. Okay. Um, as part of my five-part earnings, port, earnings uh, certain portfolio series, I recently created a video that I just alluded to earlier detailing the macro tilt strategy that I use in conjunction with the earnings certain family of portfolios. And the key takeaway here on this slide is I want to make sure that you're all aware that this is applicable to any actively managed core equity strategy, specifically if you're interested in 
um, in, in learning about those benchmark biases and the tilt strategies that I utilize when managing the ECP family. Um, you can watch my adding tilt for upside capture webinar and also learn more about the earning certain family of portfolios by following the link in the description of this particular webinar below. Uh, it's obviously it's free and there's no obligation. So I definitely encourage you to check that out and, and obviously shoot me an email. Give us a call if you've got questions. Uh, point number five is. Do not fear sector exclusion relative to the benchmarks to enhance your core equity returns, right? So we got to challenge these traditional asset allocation models. And, you know, in doing so, ask yourself, do you really need to have exposure to every single sector all the time? Uh, if you have been watching my webinars over the last year and a half or so, you know the answer to that is absolutely not. Um, definitely use the Zacks ETF rank where it makes sense to use ETFs um, and use the Zacks recommendation and the rank for individual stocks. I always, always recommend, you know, using a strategy that's, that's high conviction, high quality. The ECP strategy itself fits that bill. Um, favor growth and growth at a reasonable price. Uh, in future webinars, I'm going to go over growth and growth at a reasonable price, what it means. These are terms that are just thrown around generically way too much. We'll actually put some definition around it. And I'll show you some examples. Um, and you know I like to use value-oriented stocks to fill sector industry exposure. Uh, but beware of value traps. Again, I'm going to do a webinar on this as well. Um, most stocks are cheap for a reason, and we'll explore that in a future webinar. So the idea here is challenge third-party research with your own analysis. Use the Zach's research as well. It's, it's independent and it's very good. Um, use those longer duration hyper growth stocks sparingly to add additional risk return exposure as well. That can never hurt. Uh, with regard to cash, there's one, one really critical thing to consider and that it's really not a store of value in a long-term inflationary environment, if in fact that's the environment we're entering. So I've got some, some alternatives to cash, but the number one point I want to make here is that lower and higher cash reserves may be warranted for diversification as well. So you don't necessarily just need to cut cash. Um, there may be a reason to actually hold more cash, and that may actually help your diversification. So. Um, just pay attention to that and be critical of cash uh, in, in your use of cash in your asset allocation models here in this post-COVID environment. Um, I've added gold as an asset class to this particular webinar, and I did it literally just, just this week. Um, and I did it only because I've had several questions, including a question that came at me uh, during last week's webinar. I actually responded to it uh, out on YouTube. and and that is with gold, we've got really one critical consideration that we have to take into account. And in terms of using gold as an inflationary hedge, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have a good track record. If you look at the high inflation periods over the past 40 years, I've got, them, I've got three of them outlined up here. Um, 1980 to 1984, we had inflation of about 6.5% annually. Gold investors literally lost 10% a year. And I mean, you can just, you can do this really quickly. Um, in the research system or, or probably even at advisor tools. I didn't try it in advisor tools, but I went right to the research system and just uh, and, and looked at this. 1988, 1991, inflation was up 4.5% annually. Gold investors lost 7.5% per year. That's per year. Uh, this is the startling one. Uh, 1973 to 79, inflation was up almost 9% annually. Gold investors actually gained 34% per year compounded. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, so it's it's very, very much so mixed. Um, so a broad-based commodity ETF may stand a better chance at appreciating with inflation. So I always like to stick with commodity baskets that are that are more akin to have industrial demand. So gold is uh, my comment here, my last thought, it's probably the most important thought, is is gold is more likely effective for overall portfolio diversification versus solely as an inflationary hedge. So there is a there is a spot for gold, but if your sole purpose is to use it as an inflationary hedge, 
Um, look at past performance. Obviously, that's not going to be indicative necessarily of future performance, but it, gold just does not have a very good track record. And I just want to make sure you understand that. Okay. So um, that's about it for this week. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button below and be sure to subscribe for future videos. If you have any questions or ideas for future videos, please leave a comment below or email me at tnyland at zax.com. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter at Tim Nyland. Again, if you want a copy of my slide deck, and I encourage everyone to have a copy of this particular deck, uh, just go ahead and shoot us an email. We'll get it out to you. If you're interested in getting started with Advisor Tools or the Zax Research System, or if you're looking to upgrade your current subscription, please contact our world-class support at advisortools at zax.com and at zrs at zax.com. Thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you all next week.